Regina, but oh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not sure if he's still after it, but um, I guess I'm not really sure if Regina needs an introduction. Um, she is um, so popular and so famous and been <laughs> um, but you know we all know that um, Regina is the owner and managing part, uh, attorney of the Edwards family law and she's been practicing since 2001 she focuses on family law um, heavily and um, I guess she's been litigating um, I guess for the past 20 years and if there are any issues Chances are Regina, um, you know, seen it and uh, experienced it and litigated it. And Regina, thank you so much for agreeing to be our speaker today. And thank you so much for all the work that you are doing um, for the community, for mentoring so many attorneys have been and for being such a great resource. Um, majority of the people that are members of the section and friends of the section, uh, people who come to our meetings, are aware that Regina is also um, I guess a founder and a host of the, um, I guess, Facebook page or a platform that's called Lawyer on the Beach. And um, I'm sure Regina will tell us a little bit more about that, but she's one of the very few people that I know personally that um, was able to achieve the, uh, I guess, alluded life-work balance and she's successfully practicing in, you know, balancing other aspects of her life um, with the successful, their successful practice. Thank you, Regina. And you know, the reins are all yours. Sure. Uh, first, I want to make sure that um, you can hear me and then you can see the first slide, which says how to survive your next Zoom hearing or trial. Yes, we do. Thank you. Yay. Okay. Um, and how much time do I have? I'm going to put my timer on. Um, I guess officially the meeting is until uh, one o'clock, but um, I'm sure. Oh, okay. We're good. People, yeah. Okay. Um, so thanks for the introduction, Dina. Um, I started a Facebook group called Lawyer on the Beach last year, about probably June, July or something like that. And the point of the group really was to talk about my tech stuff. I use tech to automate my practice and to practice virtually because I just don't like being in the office. Um, I'm actually taking that group literally today because I'm actually at the beach in Destin and I'm doing this presentation from there. So the goal was to kind of give other lawyers tools of how to take their practice virtually. And then of course, when COVID hit, um, it became very popular because people that were kind of resistant to a virtual practice now were forced to do it. So um, I'll give you the link at the end of the presentation, but it's just a free group that I have. So um, people can just get the resources that I use in order to, to run my practice virtually. So I'm going to do a very, very brief overview of the basics. There are tons of videos on YouTube of, of Zoom. So hopefully most of you know how it works already because we've been doing Zoom trials for a while, but I'll just go over it a little bit briefly. Obviously, these are the controls on the bottom. The start video and the unmute, video, the unmute button, they are your friends. Please use them judiciously. Um, so what I've noticed in hearings, judges are pretty lenient about that. If you need to confer with your client, don't be afraid to ask the court to do that. And you just mute yourself, stop your video, and then you can just call your client. And I don't think that's something that people are aware they have the opportunity to do, but definitely take advantage of it. Um, Zoom also has these great little tools. I'm sure most of you have figured out how to change backgrounds by now. And they just updated their um, settings that allow you to um, not only touch up your appearance, but there's a little slider. So this is what it looks like slid all the way down. So of course I look like Gollum. And then this is what it's when it slid all the way to the right. And then all of a sudden I look like Beyonce. Um, but I usually put it somewhere in the middle so it doesn't look too insane, but it, it definitely helps. Um, it also helps if you're in low light, they have an adjustment for low light. I have pretty good light here. So you're probably not gonna tell a difference, but you can just see me clicking it off there is a difference. So just sort of play with your settings to make sure you have the best setup. Um, another warning is don't use the chat feature during your trial. So even though it says during the chat, um, it says on the chat feature that it's only, that only a certain person can see it, that's actually not true. So at the end of the Zoom session, the host, which is usually the court, gets a transcript of everything that happened. Um, so even though, so it, it's, it says it's private, it's actually not. So it's probably not a good time for you to sort of chat in the 
you know, in the chat feature with your opposing counsel, like, oh, I can't believe we got this judge today. So just do not use the chat feature for any reason. Um, if you're going to converse with your client, then just do it with text message, do it with um, Google um, chats using Google Doc. I've got some tips on that later on, but just please, please, please do not use the chat feature. Unless, of course, you're, you don't mind the host seeing whatever, whatever it is that you're saying. Um, so here's a couple of tips about my setup. So this is the, this is the setup from the first Zoom trial that I did. Let's see if I can get my laser pointer on. Um, and obviously I'm, I'm using a PowerPoint presentation to present this and then I'll talk later on about how I use PowerPoint presentations in my actual trial. So get an external microphone. So this is my external microphone here and I've got it on today, which is this. And I can send a link to it. The external microphone always sounds and picks up um, the clarity of your voice a lot better than the internal microphone in your computer. I tested it, it's like, it's not, it's like night and day. Also get an external light if you don't have good lighting. Um, I've seen a lot of Zoom trials where you can barely see the other person's face. It's just not a good effect. So if you don't have good lighting in your office in general, you can purchase a Zoom or a ring light, which actually diffuses it, which makes you look a lot better than you actually do, which is my personal preference. Um, also, my advice is to Zoom with a device other than your laptop if you can. So for this setup, this is a Surface Pro that I was actually Zooming from. This is my laptop that I was working on. I had a placard um, with my name on it. My client for this case was in the office with me. And this is a really, really long table. So he was at the other end of the table and I printed the exhibit. If you're going to do it that way, please print the exhibits for your client. It makes it so much easier because if they've got a laptop in front of them, which is focused on them and they're trying to you know, answer the attorney's questions, it makes it difficult for them to look on the screen for exhibits and testify at the same time versus it's a little more natural to pick up the printed copy of the exhibits because that's how you would do it if you were in a, an in-person hearing. So I just found the flow to be a little bit better if the exhibits are printed, if you can, if you can manage it. Um, so some more tips, if the client is in the room with you, use a central microphone. If you are on one side of the table with your computer and if your client is on the other side of the table with, with his or her computer, you can't both be using your microphone because you're gonna get some wicked feedback. So you need to have a central microphone, Amazon sells them um, in order to avoid it. I did not realize this until I was doing my trial. So I did have this external microphone. Um, so I just, it's got a really long cord. So I just stuck it in the middle of the table and it solved all the problems. But there are a lot of Bluetooth microphones that are specifically designed for Zoom presentations and it picks up everybody's voice clearly without having to shout or anything like that. So just that's a tip if you're gonna have your client in um, the office. Sort of a next level tip, which I haven't done yet, but I'm thinking about is you can connect your laptop to, or just, just cast your presentation to a TV. And so that way, when you're sort of watching the parts of the trial that you're not um, actively engaged in, it's a little easier than just staring at your screen the entire time, or if you wanna use your screen for something else. Um, if your client is in a separate location, still have them print the exhibits. I typically have my exhibits ready at least five days prior, and I send them to the other attorney, and now I'm sending them to opposing counsel ahead of time as well. Um, so I have my client print all of the exhibits where they are. So again, it's a lot easier for them to just pick up the exhibit and look at it versus looking at it on screen. So here's some Zoom fails. Most of you all are not gonna be um, guilty of this, but dresses if you're going to court, make sure you tell your client to do the same thing. If you're sharing the screen, I found out during a trial of mine when opposing counsel was trying to play a video, we couldn't hear the video when she played it. And I think it was because her earplugs were were plugged in. That's the only reason I could think of it because everything else was fine. Um, so that's just a tip if you are playing the audio, make sure you don't have your earplugs plugged in or connected to Bluetooth because then you're not gonna be able to hear the audio. Um, I suggest sitting at a wide table of desk or wide table or desk so you can have your exhibits um, spread out in front of you. Um, don't have your client next to you. COVID still exists. I don't know why I have to keep telling people that, but I've seen trials where the client is at the attorney's office and they're right up at the you know, on top of each other, staring at one screen. Honestly, it looks weird. It's not a good presentation. Um, the judges get really frustrated because they're both trying to look at the computer and they're trying to look at things at the same time. And it's just not a good idea. So if your client is going to be in the office with you or in the office in a different room, have them have their own device and have the exhibits um, spread out in front of them so they're not constantly, you know, doing this while they're looking at exhibits. It just looks odd. Wear pants, um, that should go without saying, but I will say this happened in a case of mine someone stood up and it wasn't good so moving on 
So this is a shot of what my setup looks like. Um, this is what I'm currently using. So I have three screens for this presentation. This is a, just a regular monitor. So yes, I did actually drag this monitor into the beach. This is my laptop and this is a portable um, touch screen, a portable touch screen monitor. So, and I'll show you the benefit. And this is of course my, um, my external microphone. So the benefit of that is this. So the middle screen I usually use to take notes and, um, and that way it allows me to keep eye contact because the camera is focused on me from the, um, from the laptop. On the left is what is projecting to the audience. So on the left currently is the PowerPoint presentation that you see. On the right is the PowerPoint presentation that I see. And as you can see, it's got the current slide. It shows me what my upcoming slide is and it's got notes. So during my trial, this is extremely valuable to me. So when I'm preparing my PowerPoint presentation, I've got all the notes that I need. So when a particular screen or a particular um, piece of evidence is being presented, all of my notes about that piece of evidence are going to be you know, right below it. Questions that I have for the client or for the adverse party are all going to be in the notes section. So it's, it's just a lot easier to have it all in one place than to look for different locations as I'm going through my, um, my trial presentation. So just kind of a general rule, if you don't know how to try a case, Zoom is not gonna help you. Zoom is not gonna be your friend. So try not to think of a Zoom, Zoom trial as that much different than an in-person trial. So that means foundational rules still apply. You still have to get in evidence, um, you know, the response to an objection, but I got it in discovery is still not going to fly. Um, so you just need to make sure that even though it seems like it's a more relaxed atmosphere, it's still a trial and all of these principles are still gonna apply and you need to just make sure that you use them because Zoom doesn't um, ameliorate any of that. Um, same thing with your client. If your client isn't prepared, then a Zoom trial really just kind of exacerbates um, that non-preparation. So here's some of my advice about how to prepare your client for the Zoom hearing. Tell them how the process is going to work. Do a trial run. What I do for all of my Zoom trials is my Zoom trial preparation meeting is called exactly that. And we do it about five or six days before the actual trial. So I let them know. So we actually run through the exhibit. I show them the PowerPoint presentation and let them see everything um, that I'm going to be presented. Um, I actually give my clients all of the exhibits ahead of time. That usually happens about a week to, to 10 days prior to the hearing. Um, all my exhibits are pre-numbered and labeled and I upload them to my client for their feedback. And once I finalize the exhibits, I shove them into my PowerPoint presentation. And then as I'm doing the um, trial prep meeting, we actually run through the presentation. So it goes, it goes much more smoothly on the actual day. Um, make sure you tell your clients how to dress. I prefer that everyone dress professionally. This is a professional meeting. I've seen other trials um, you know, because I'm, I'm a stalker and I just <laughs> look at random Fulton trials on YouTube and they're fun to watch. Um, but I've seen people do trials in their car. I saw one guy do his entire custody trial, which he won pro se, by the way. I was really impressed. But sitting outside of Starbucks, <laughs> not highly recommended, but he did it. But um, with our clients, I think we obviously we need to come a little bit better than that. So they need to be in a quiet location. Um, hopefully with no background behind them um, so that the court can pay attention to what the client has to say instead of being distracted by the location or anything else. Um, make sure to remind them how to address them as if they're going to court, remind them how to address the judge and opposing counsel. And again, a relaxed um, setting doesn't mean that we lose, sir, ma'am, your honor, those kinds of things. Don't ever have them zoom from a phone. It looks terrible because you're always looking up their nostrils. And it makes it difficult for the <laughs> thanks, David. <laughs> it also makes it difficult um, for them to look at the exhibits I'm showing them because they're simultaneously trying to talk and then look at this tiny little screen for exhibits. Um, so just don't have them zoom from a phone. Use a laptop. If they don't have a laptop, let them they can borrow a tablet, laptop from somebody. I don't know, figure it out. But I just don't ever have my client zoom from a phone. It has to be a laptop. Um, send them both, party, both parties exhibits and have them print them. Um, this is kind of aspirational. A lot of times, my last trial, I got my exhibits 13 minutes before the trial started, so there wasn't a whole lot I could do about that. Um, but in some of my cases, we've been pretty cooperative about exchanging exhibits well ahead of time and sending the court actually one link um, so the court can download all the exhibits at, at once and so can my client so they can have them all spread out in front of them, which just makes it go a lot easier. 
So here are some other tips about preparing, which really apply to both in-person and Zoom. Keep their answers short and concise. This is amplified in a Zoom setting where you have issues sort of hearing each other and there's sort of this distance anyway. So we just don't need these long-winded rants. Um, keep them focused and on task. Give the client the proposed orders and before proposed findings. And my key phrase is don't forget fluffy. And so fluffy comes from a case I had about, gosh, 15 years ago where I thought I did really, really well. I got my client everything she wanted. She got a whole bunch of alimony, which frankly she really didn't deserve. I mean, it was just a great result. And as we're leaving the courtroom, she says, well, what about my dog? And I can't remember the name, but it was like Fluffy or Jiggers or just some, you know, unnecessarily cute name that I had forgotten to ask about. And thankfully the husband hated the dog, so he had no problem giving her the dog. But it just sort of reminded me that I need to have proposed findings that the court, that the client reviews and approves before we go to court. So that way I make sure that I get a ruling on every single thing. So at this point, I have a pretty much an outline of everything and it includes pets. So it says, do you have any pets? What do you want the division of pets to be? So that means they sort of let me know what the, what they would like the court to rule on. And that way we make sure that the court rules on every single issue. So don't forget Fluffy. So with the exhibits, send the exhibits ahead of time so they can familiarize themselves with the exhibit. It's just, you know, these hearings take a long time anyway, so it just doesn't make any sense for them to stare for 30 seconds at their own pay stub trying to figure out that it's their own pay stub. So, you know, run through the exhibits ahead of time and it just really kind of speed th speeds things up. Um, so here are some more thoughts on proposed orders. Honestly, judges don't want to have to do everything. So I've seen a lot of times where people just come and honestly vomit their problems on the court and then say, well, judge, you fix it. Okay. Well, I think part of my job as an attorney is to, you know, give the trier of fact a reasonable solution to the problem that I'm presenting. I think it's my job to assist the court in finding a fair result. So even though I'm advocating for my client, I have to advocate for a solution that's going to make sense. If my guy has been arrested 12 times for DUI, including the night before trial, you know, asking for custody is just going to be white noise, white noise to the court. So Having a proposed findings that match the facts of your case are really gonna help you immeasurably and it's gonna help you uh, keep you on track. Um, at the very least, have a proposed finding sheet that just sort of has the broad strokes. I want custody, I want you know $10,000 a month in alimony, I want $1,500 in child support. Um, and it just sort of keeps the court on track as you're going through your case um, and lets them know what it is that you're asking for. So actually preparing the case for the hearing. We do the orders, we pre-number the exhibits, and I send to opposing counsel along with the exhibit list. I create a Dropbox folder for the judge and all numbered exhibits. I, I prefer this method. Digitally insert the numbers on the exhibits, and I create, I do this a couple of ways. You can just insert it using any sort of PDF creator, or you can create a PDF binder and then put all the exhibits at once. So the catalyst for this is, I kind of think of, about it from the judge's clerk's perspective, and I actually did get calls from two of the Gwinnett judge's clerks that kind of asked me to talk about this issue because, you know, attorneys have just been randomly emailing them exhibits. And the problem with that is when they go to print it, somebody else could be printing at the same time, and they get to a printer and they see 50 pages of a bank statement, of bank statements, nothing numbered, nothing in order, and they have to go back to their computer and just sort of put the puzzle together for the judge to figure out who sent the exhibit, what number the exhibit is, and what in what order the pages should be. Just don't make it difficult for them. So if you actually insert the numbers on the exhibits, every single page is going to say at the top, exhibit one, page one. It'll make it so much easier, easier for the judge's assistant to get the exhibits in order and put it in front of the judge. So this is, an, is it, this is an example of my pre-numbered exhibit list. This is from an actual case of mine. And as you can see, it's pretty specific. So if a court is gonna take something under advisement and you have a whole bunch of exhibits, having a pretty detailed exhibit list like this is pretty helpful. Um, because if the court is kind of thinking in their mind, oh, I, I wanna see that email about, you know, the text from the stepmom to, um, you know, to the wife on a particular date the exhibit numbers and the name of the exhibits are pretty specific instead of just having 10 you know exhibits that says email from stepmom to mom that's not really going to help point them in the right direction um i think i may have talked about this but inter introducing video and audio recordings they have to be introduced in the same way as if you were in real court so if you're in real court you probably would have a flash drive that you would hand to the court reporter 
In this case, I usually just drop them the link. They usually already have it because prior to the trial, I've already sent the link to the judge's assistant and they usually just forward it over to the court reporter. But if anything changes, make sure you send the link to via Dropbox or Google Drive, OneDrive, whatever you're using. Um, so the court reporter actually has the hard copy of the um, audio because they need it for the transcript. Um, you can also play it during the hearing using share your screen. I do that a lot. And then again, make sure you don't use headphones because nobody will be able to hear it. So this is an example of me putting the numbers on the exhibit. I used to do it this way and I actually did it in a slightly different way, which I'm about to show you. So hopefully this will play. <clears throat> okay, so this is just a little video that I did showing how I um, insert the headers on my exhibit. So I just numbered three different pages, one, two, and three. And then I use Nuance Pro. So as you see, I'm going at the top. I enter headers and footers. And this is a template that I use. So all I have to do in this case is just enter the number of the exhibit. So in this case, I'm numbering it exhibit five. As you can see, each page now has defendant exhibit. It has the number and then it has the page number. So it's super easy to do. I do it for all of my exhibits. Frankly, sometimes I do it for opposing counsel's exhibits before I send it over because I'm just kind of um, OCD like that. Um, but it just makes it a lot easier when they're printing the exhibits and you're putting it in front of the judge for them to not have to piece together a puzzle of what exhibit is what. Um, so I did talk about this briefly, uh, communicating with clients during hearing, text, portal. I use links as my portal. So I'm, when I'm communicating with my clients during the hearing, I'm sometimes using the portal. And one idea, which I haven't done, but it sounds like a good idea, is using a shared Google Doc because that's just an internet link that they can use from their phone, their laptop, and you're just editing the same document. So you can actually keep a running dialogue that's, that's constantly updated um, instead of you know, texting in any, or any of the other methods. And there's a ton of instant messaging programs. I think Yahoo still has one. Google Hangouts is one. Slack is one. Um, obviously, you can't coach your client through the direct examination. That's not the point of it, obviously. But if um, the other side is on cross-examination and they say something that's completely untrue and, the, and you know, your client wants to communicate with you about something that we should present to counteract that, um, then this is a good tool to, to use during that process. Or don't be afraid to ask for a brief recess. Um, an attorney posted in a group of mine yesterday, and it just kind of was a, a a reminder to do this, um, the other attorney had presented an exhibit which she thought matched something she already had and it didn't. And it sort of made her client look like a liar and it just kind of turned out to be a mistake. And unfortunately the evidence closed and there was really nothing that can be done about it. But don't be afraid to ask for a recess before closing the evidence, mute your, mute your video, mute your um, audio, call your client. And that way, if there's anything, other evidence that needs to be introduced to refute something that's happened or to explain everything, just just take that opportunity to do it before um, evidence has closed. And from what I can tell, the judges are really lenient with this and it's not really um, been an issue. All right, so now briefly, I'm gonna show you some of the slides from a trial that I recently did. So I represented the winner in this case, which was the defendant. I was defending a contempt action, which was completely frivolous. And I actually kind of sued for uh, 9, 15, 14 fees for the first time in my life and I won. Um, but this is, and I don't, I don't like that law, but that's a, that's a whole other TED talk. Um, so this is what I do. So this is the original, the kind of placard screen for starting the trial. And during my opening statement, I kind of just go through and highlight what it is that I am looking for. So in this case, it was about share credit. That was the big thing. So I put the actual language on the screen and the, um, I highlighted the part that was most relevant, at least I thought, to the case. So the court would sort of always have that as I'm giving my opening statement. And I also listed my wants in terms of he's not in contempt and this is why. And then I went through my request for um, attorney's fees and then the basis for it. So just kind of having this on the screen at all times, it's kind of like a roadmap, which I think client, I mean, I think judges appreciate in terms of where are you going, where are you going, what are we about to talk about? Um, and it, like I said, having this language on the screen at all times while I'm making my argument about that particular point, I think is pretty helpful. Um, also, what I'd like to do is just sort of let everyone know where we're going. So in, in this case, there was an issue about whether or not he was in contempt of um, medical expenses, and he wasn't. Um, but having this card just sort of highlights this is the next thing that we're going to talk about. Um, so you won't be able to say all of this at the same time, but this is why I did this way. So with PowerPoint, 
this is actually six pages of a document. It's a six page document. And you can input them on individual slides, but I didn't want to do it that way. So I, I compressed it and all six pages are on one slide. But PowerPoint does have this magnifying glass that allows you to zoom in on what you need to do. I did it this way on purpose because I liked the effect of it. So all of the green circled is where my client had actually paid the expense, even though he was being accused of not paying the expense. So visually, it kind of looks cool because there's a whole bunch of green and only one red, um, which if once I highlighted on it and zoomed into it, it turns out um, that the expense was not provided on time and it was a fairly recent expense. Um, so, and it was only $56, which wasn't a big deal. So I just kind of like the effect of having a PowerPoint presentation and being able to sort of zoom in on exhibits this way and you know highlight the things in the exhibit that I you know want the court to look at. This is just a simple Excel spreadsheet that I dropped into my PowerPoint presentation when we were just we were discussing the medical expenses. Um, so it just makes it easier for the court to look at this. This of course is a demonstrative exhibit which was backed up by 15 pages of uh, medical records, but obviously this is a lot easier to look at than 15 pages of medical records. So both were submitted in evidence, but this is just sort of, this is a, a clean way for the court to sort of look at everything. Um, this is just another title board, title card to get to the next issue. This is another example of a, a critical issue where I was able to kind of have this on the screen at all times and then highlight what was the critical issue out to the court. So I, I've just found that sort of displaying exhibits in this way, I think it's, it's super helpful um, and persuasive. It's never gonna win your case if your case is you know, garbage, but it certainly helps. Um, and what I've found of, after 20 years of practicing family law that you know, by the time you get to trial, honestly, a lot is about appearances. I was gonna win this case regardless. It was just that kind of a case. Um, but having an organized presentation is always helpful. So even when you lose a case, your client wants to know that you've done everything that you, you know, need to do to get it out there and that you've, you know, kind of laid it out on, on the field, so to speak. So I think being organized and just having um, a well-received presentation is helpful. Um, and even if you lose, at least the, the client isn't looking at you like, well, you know, you didn't know how to present your exhibits and this was missing and this was missing. And, why was the other side so organized and we were so disorganized? You know, appearances are everything. So I just always recommend that if you appear organized, then it, it can't possibly help. Um, this is just another example of a demonstrative exhibit that I added to my presentation after um, the other side testified because she was accusing dad of being late on child support and I was able to pull these records and show the screen that she demonstrably he was not late and her response was, oh, he's in a different time zone. So that's why I marked him late. But um, also opening statements I put on here. So this is the for a completely different case. This is what I wanted. This is what I requested in opening. Uh, I had about a four hour trial on a legitimation uh, with requests for bad expenses and a contempt action. Um, so these were my asks at the opening statement. Um, it changed a little bit between the opening and the closing because naturally when you have a full trial, sometimes there are some facts that come out that might change your ass. So we got a recess between, um, which before closing and I quickly went in and you know changed my ass. So the court was able to look at what my new ask was based on you know what had happened at the trial and the court seems you know pretty appreciative of that. So this is just a side by side of the opening versus the closing and I just sort of explained why my ask changed from opening to the closing. For example, this particular guy, uh, I was representing mom, dad wanted to have Thursday parenting time because his brother who he lived with had children the exact same age as these children and he wanted everyone to be together at the same time, which made total sense to me. So we just changed our ask to, to accommodate that request. Um, and then we went through attorney's fees and I adjusted my request a little bit. Um, and then also child support. We actually found more income that I had anticipated. So we changed our ask on that as well. So just sort of having a visual opening and closing, I think is pretty powerful. Um, I use PowerPoint to do it, but I've just heard of Google Slides today. So I'm gonna play with that and see if that's a better option. So far, I really like PowerPoint, um, just because, you know, as I say, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, and it's just a lot more visually interesting than me just, you know, talking at the screen for, you know, several hours, but having these um, slides. Um, one thing I will, 
question to use. I mean, sharing your screen is not difficult to do. Just make sure you, um, you know, practice it. You know, during my last trial, I actually had to display all of opposing counsel's exhibits because they weren't really quite sure how to display them. I actually had to send, you know, her exhibits to the court for her. And then when she was questioning about questioning my client, I just went ahead and displayed the exhibits for her because she was having a difficult time. Um, so just familiarize yourself with it. So again, it's a, an appearance thing. You know, if your client is like, seriously, why is the other attorney showing our exhibits? It's just kind of a bad look. So if you guys have any questions, I'm ready for questions. And also if you want to join my group, um, it's called Lawyer on the Beach and just answer all the questions. They're not hard. It's just like, are you a lawyer? <laughs> and will you not spam my page? Um, but if you don't answer all the questions, you just get put into some virtual black hole and it'll take me forever to accept you if I have to chase you down and figure out whether or not you're a lawyer. So anybody have any questions? Uh, Regina, um, I have a question. You know, I'm, I'm going to also allow a couple of minutes um, for other people if they have a question. And again, you can use uh, Q&A or you can use chat. Okay. Uh, I had a question. Um, when you do your presentations, um, I'm assuming, so, so how do, exactly do you uh, incorporated into portions of trial. So like, for example, do you have a couple of slides for closing, a couple of mm -hmm. uh, slides for yeah. opening, and then separate slides for, for I, I guess, your case in chief? And then how do you um, actually communicate to the judges um, what you actually do? Are, are you explaining and saying, okay, I'm going to use a presentation. It's just a demonstrative. It's not an exhibit or it is actually my exhibit. So how do you kind of do an introduction. I actually didn't explain it. I just did it. So in the trial I recently had, it was um, with Judge Hutchinson and I just, I just went for it. So I just said, here's my visual opening. Um, and then my exhibits had already been given to the court. So the exhibits were the exact same exhibits that the court and opposing counsel already had. I just had them embedded into my PowerPoint. So yeah, I do the whole trial on PowerPoint. I have the opening. I have the ask what it is that we're basically, why are we here taking up your time page? Um, and then I just go through and because I pre-number my exhibit, it's pretty easy to plan the order. So I was the defendant in that case, but I knew that they were going to call my client for cross-examination first. Um, so I just was able to plan the order of my exhibits. Um, and then my exhibit list that I keep for myself has not only the exhibit number on it, but also the PowerPoint slide. So it makes it pretty easy. So even when opposing counsel was cross-examining my client and, you know, if she was trying to find an exhibit, I could easily just, you know, scroll through my presentation and put it up. So I just said, I need screen share privileges and they just let me have at it. And I just, I just go to town. Um, Regina, another question that I had is that, have you ever um, faced any kind of objections because essentially you know, you're using demonstrative and you're talking and it, you know, what you, your bullet points essentially are right in the judge's face and opposing parties face while you're talking, have you ever, have you ever been in a situation when objection was raised because you know essentially what's on the screen and what's been shared is just a demonstrative it's not actual exhibit i haven't had any objection and i, I think because most people realize it's not a valid objection and i i cure most of those objections by not sandbagging everybody i'm actually kind of irritated in almost all of my zoom trials my opposing counsel is dropping exhibits on me the morning of trial i mean why it's not it's, it's not that hard like you should have been prepping this case in the entire time so I give everything to my opposing counsel at least five, seven days prior. So they have the opportunity to review all of the back of documents and compare them and make sure that my demonstrative exhibit is accurate. So if they don't bother to take the time and compare it, that's not really my problem. So I haven't had any objections, but I don't think it would withstand any objection because it is allowed. I can't remember the code section off the top of my head, but it's a summary evidence, which is allowed as long as um, the court has opportunity and the other side has opportunity to inspect the full document and they do. So there really isn't a valid objection to it other than, oh crap, that really looks my, my, makes my client look bad and that's not a thing. Um, so Trinity asked the question, can I share a sample PowerPoint? So I will send you this PowerPoint, which will have these example slides. Um, but in terms of a sample PowerPoint, the real PowerPoint is like 45 slides and it took me like 30 minutes per slide just to redact all the client information. So I really don't wanna, go through and do all of that, but it, it'll give you enough because I've got about six or seven slides from actual trials and you can um, build off of that. And then Trinity also asked for the green and red circles. Um, are you using nuance? Yes, that's nuance. But most of the programs have it. You can just annotate anything that way. You can highlight, you can circle, you can pretty much do whatever you want. 
I guess there is a, also a question from Georgia Lord. She asked, is it best to provide the visual aid to opposing counsel in advance usually? But it's my understanding you do not share a presentation, you share exhibits. Correct. I share the exhibit. Um, so the demonstrative exhibit is, is shared ahead of time. Sometimes it's not, you know, circled and highlighted, um, but, the, but the summary exhibit is provided ahead of time. So it's the same thing if you're handing the court something in court and you've highlighted it and you give the exact same thing to opposing counsel at the same time and you highlight it. So it's the same thing. So they get the exhibit, it just may not be highlighted. I don't see any other questions. Um, and again, the, uh, Regina, you provided the link, a reference to your Lawyer on the Beach, which is a very, very useful, useful resource. And I encourage everybody to join. Um, yeah, so the presentation will actually be there as well. So once you join, all of my stuff is in a link that's at the top of the about section. So this link is going to be there. It's called Gwinnett Zoom presentation or something like that. So you can download the entire PowerPoint if you want. To. Yeah, but I just want to, um, I guess that concludes our meeting today. Thank you so very much, Regina. And thank you sure. so much, David, for your time. And I just want to um, thank everybody who joined us today. We will have our next, um, I guess, section meeting in um, October. I will keep you posted, but um, it was lovely to see all the familiar faces and names um, in the list of attendees. This is, I guess, as close as we will get to, you know, something similar to a calendar call or seeing people. No, I miss people. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. And this is why we are doing it, you know, um, thank you very much everybody for joining us. Thank you speakers for your time. Please consider becoming um, a section member. Regina actually was um, um, a president of family law section for the Green Bar Association at some point. Thank you, um, Regina. Sure. And um, we really want to stay in touch and um, thank you so, so very much. It was lovely to see everybody. Stay safe. Uh, right. just, Bye. Uh, just a, a quick thing. If anybody does want a, a recommendation for a, an exceptional uh, loan officer that can handle post-divorce uh, very easily, let me know. Same thing, I've got a number of really good realtors I'd be able to, uh, to refer. So again, thanks everybody for your time and I hope I didn't bore you too much. All right, thank you guys. Yeah.